Welcome to our first podcast. This is crazy. Um, yeah, this, this is going to be a strange thing to try out. But Yeah, this is very uh, in its experimental uh, stage. Um, we're just giving this a go, seeing what could maybe come of it. We are two uh, mixed martial arts fans, um, hardcore fans, and we are here just to talk MMA. Yeah, there's a lot of different intricacies to MMA as a sport, and uh, being such enthusiasts of the sport, we know how a lot of times, since it's still sort of in the growing stage, sometimes you don't really have too many outlets, so we thought we'd try to go ahead and sort of create some discussion about topics and give perspectives to things that people may not have heard or just if they're looking for something to listen to. Yeah, and um, so this first episode that we're going to give a try here is uh, going to be a should you watch. Um, we have an upcoming UFC fight night card this Saturday uh, in Brazil. It's going to be aired on Fox Sports 1. And uh, we're basically going to discuss, you know, determine to the to the casual fan or hardcore fan, whoever you are, is this worth watching? And um, so to kind of kick it off, we should probably go over what a fight night card is. Yeah, because there's a... Uh, the UFC holds a bunch of different events and types of events and <laughs> maybe a confusing amount if you're just getting into the sport of different types of events that are all aired on different networks and programs and such so it can get confusing so to put it simply there are four main ones in the current modern age of the ufc you have the ones that are most common that you've probably heard or even watched and it's ufc pay-per-views and those are going to be your numbered events so you'd have ufc 200 you have ufc 200 202 um and those are historically the bigger cards and then after that you have fox cards um which are a different beast in of them themselves uh you have fight pass cards which is a new thing that just came about from you know within the last two years it's this online database that the ufc is trying to launch and promote um, and then lastly, you have the fight night cards. And these are the cards that air uh, typically on Fox Sports 1. Um, so yeah, it's this is the, we're getting a fight night card Saturday. So let's focus on that and let's kind of break down the three main components of a fight night card. Yeah, because traditionally fight night cards are sort of the little brother of events in basic terms they provide new and up and coming fighters a chance to kind of break out and show their talent to the world uh while having some older and higher ranked fighters on the card to still kind of have a draw to make sure that people actually watch it and Generally, it's more the lower-ranked fighters and such because these are the free cards that are on TV. So that's classically what they are. But the the structure of them is uh, they're made up of three components, right? They you have your main card, um, and then you have the undercard or the prelims, uh, and then the third and last one is the early prelims. Um, so that's the basic structure uh, that fight night cards take. Now let's start talking about what it maybe should be. What is your ideal fight night card? How is it structured? Well, you see, because in essence, fight night cards are a brilliant platform for fighters to kind of break out into the limelight, pretty much. Sure. And that's traditionally what they're supposed to be for, but lately I feel like the UFC has 
kind of a dropping the ball on a lot of what they would consider matchups suitable for a fight night card. Because uh, in my opinion, fight night cards need to have importance to them along with showing newcomers into the sport. So I guess that it's kind of a subjective look at it because depending on who you are, fights may be important or not important. Uh, if you're a hardcore fan and know a ton of fighters, there's probably going to be a fight on there that to you is an important fight that to maybe an average watcher isn't considered an important fight. So it's kind of like where you draw the line of what you consider important enough and worthy enough to be put on free TV pretty much. So, You know, I, I've spent some time thinking about this. Um, what, if it were up to me, what would my perfect design for a Fight Night card look like? Um, if it were up to me, Fight Night card would typically look like this. You'd have a main, of, uh, starting with the main card, the main event is uh, a privilege to headline. Uh, if you headline a UFC card, it better be because... There's some sort of important aspect behind it. Yeah. Like, it, the stakes have to be there, and the stakes have to mean something. Exactly. There's got to be stakes. And so, with that being said, I think a main event should be a fight between two top ten fighters. It doesn't matter what weight class. Two top ten fighters so that you are giving the fans of the sport... Uh, the highest level of MMA that you can see, and that that should be the main event. Um, and that's a um, very important thing to have on the card because, as we said earlier, these fight night cards are generally for a lot of times people that don't know too much about the sport, and it's kind of there to as they're flicking by, they catch something catches their eye, and it piques their interest, and that's very easy to do when you have high-level fighters competing, which unfortunately, sometimes the UFC doesn't put on. Exactly. We, you know, we've had those fight nights where the everyone kind of looks around and asks, why is this the main event? And it shouldn't be like that. It should be a pretty straightforward two top ten fighters in whatever division, they get the honor of headlining a fight. Follow that up with the co-main event, which is so important. The co-main event is so important to, to UFC cards and MMA cards in general but I think it should at least be a fight between two top 15 guys uh, like top 15 in that range because it, it means like they're ranked in a sense I know UFC has their rankings and they rank guys you know from the champion to number 15 um, so maybe if you had two people in the top 15 uh, co-main event on these fight cards um just to add that intrigue and continue to build uh, uh, up to the main event. The fights should get better as the night goes on. And, it, I mean, it just makes sense, too. Uh, the UFC, agree with them or not, probably disagree. They have their own rankings there. And as we've probably learned from past experience by this point, the rankings are kind of a promotional tool that the UFC uses to get people intrigued in fights. And so, especially for these fight night cards that are meant to bring new eyes to the sport and attract eyes to newer fighters, it just makes sense to have a name that on their website has a number next to it. Because anybody can look at the TV and be like, hey, oh dang, this is the number six guy versus the number eight guy. Like, this is important. Yeah, like, this a, means something. You're seeing that the highest level that's what you get from that like they go from being a name who you don't know uh to being a guy who is ranked and a guy who you know is good and one of the best in the world um so i think that's such a good guideline to have for yeah. what should be considered a main event a co-main event because you also got with main events now uh, a couple years ago they changed the rule that now all main events are five round fights so, with the fight being five rounds, it's kind of, I don't want to say deserves, but it kind of deserves to go to the guys that are out there to prove something. Uh, in my opinion, say, I don't really think a guy who is getting his first test should necessarily be a main event, because five rounds is very difficult, and 
five rounds used to be reserved for literally the top two in the division. So it's I don't want to say unfair, but it's kind of unfortunate to throw a young new prospect on his first real test into a five hard round battle, um, which could overall be good for his career. But at the same time, it's like, do you throw people to the wolves or do you kind of let them build themselves up throughout the ranks? I, I think the main event should truly be reserved for the people who have climbed the, the ladder and are right there on the doorstep, you know, of uh, possible title implications, whatever it is. If it, It's got to be two top ten guys. Even being a hardcore fan, that's the only thing that generally interest me as being when uh main events are announced for some of these cards um but continuing on uh so we got the main event i think two top 10 guys uh co-main event at least two top uh, 15 fighters and i think of the main card should be made up um of probably just you can have a name fight on there two fights that you think are going to be exciting whatever you think is really going to hit uh hit it off with the people watching for the rest of that card that'll help build to those uh, co-main and main events. Yeah, because again, it's very important for new fighters to have that chance of being a breakout performance. It's just, in my opinion, I don't know if that chance should be the main event. I feel like that chance should be with the main event uh, in relation to the main event or something. Like, put them on the main card, have people... Give people the opportunity and the chance to make a name for themselves, but yeah, I I feel like stack the card with veterans, maybe names, and up and comers, and then leave the top two slots to sort of the upper echelon because that's what's gonna draw people to the event anyways. If you have a main card filled with five fights of you don't know the names of anybody in those fights then as a new viewer especially you're not gonna tune in really because you're gonna be like all right maybe i pass this up and i go watch the next event that is a conor mcgregor fight or like a fight that they know means something exactly and um you know it's always that balance between sport and and uh a business you know um you know, if you want it to be more of a sport, I feel like you have to put aside sometimes the the name and take risks on people who aren't names yet but are in the top ten. Like, these are elite athletes, and I feel like the, the UFC should be putting more trust into some of these guys. There are guys that should be headlining cards uh, over other people, but it's just a name thing. It's they already know they're going to sell, but they're at the twilight or the end of their career. And it just, it doesn't do it for me, man. It really doesn't. Um, but so that, you know, we got an idea of what the main card should look like for a fight night. Moving down to the undercard. The undercard, in my opinion, should be headlined between two top 15 fighters. Um, main eventing, uh, the prelims or the undercard, is actually becoming more and more of an uh, important thing to the UFC like they keep pushing like oh th- these fighters are headlining the prelims or or whatever you know it's still kind of that you know the way I think about it is you know you break the card into three sections and each section is its own thing and you need a headliner for each one um, you need to build those in their respective right sex so i think headlining it two top 15 fighters is the way to go for the undercard and yeah i agree just because it's so important to have a fight that intrigues someone enough flicking by to continue on watching if you have a good fight lined up for the headliner of the prelims and someone watches that they're like oh dang i'm gonna go watch the main card uh that's why for a lot of the pay-per-views they definitely try to put either name fighter or a interesting fight as the prelim before the pay-per-view because they want people to go buy the pay-per-view after they see the prelims uh and i just don't see why the same thing shouldn't apply to a fight night card because viewers watching a card on fox sports one in terms of 
growing even their brand name of the UFC, the the free TV f- cards are just as important to try to get as many viewers possible. So I don't see why the same shouldn't apply to fight night cards with the prelims. Exactly. I mean, if you're fighting in the UFC, that should already mean you're at a certain point in your career where you truly feel that you can be the best and that you can make a run for things. And just there are certain slots on cards that are there for the type of people that are close to that. And I feel like headlining even the prelims, like like, like you were saying, that's leading into the main card. That's the thing that's going to sell the main card for you, even if it is on free TV. So I think a fight between two top 15 uh, fighters um, headlining the card, uh, the undercard, uh, would be the best way to go. And then fill the rest of it with, uh, you know, you can go with new guys. You can go with vets. Like, I feel like a lot of vets that are still names, exciting fighters, almost should be on the undercard more. Yeah, because putting those type of names on the undercard helps foster the new names to be seen like if the whole point of fight night cards which originally i think the whole point of fight night cards were to provide some of these guys an outlet to shine that is for the new guys in the ufc to try to make names for themselves just adding more reason to watch that card as a whole is just going to increase their chance of making a breakthrough exactly you know so we got the main card, we got the, you know, the prelims. Now, if we go down to the first fights of the night, the early prelims, usually there's only anywhere between two to four, I think, maybe. It, four two, is rare. Four <laughs> is very rare. It's usually two or three that um, are on the early prelims. Uh, but f- in my, my stance on it, prelims should be headlined by just a fun fight. Simple as that. Yeah. Every card, the UFC does a good job by putting on a fun fight at least one fun fight every card and you know they have that their placement in the card is just as important as if they're on the card or not you if you place these fights right it can add so much more layers to this card and really get you engaged through the entire card instead of someone just saying yeah i'll turn it on for the main event so headlining the prelims the early prelims it's got to be an exciting fight it doesn't need to be ranked guys it just needs to be a fight that you think is going to be fireworks yeah because for the the early early prelims just by nature they're not going to be seen by too many people maybe other than really hardcore fans um and so i feel like those early early prelims are more of a chance of the people Proving, hey, I should be in the UFC. Um, which. The newbies, you know. Yeah, I mean, hardcore fans are gonna like that. They'll go and they'll check out the fights and they'll be like, man, this guy looks like he could be a prospect later down the road. The more casual experience probably doesn't really care about them too much because more than likely it's two guys making their UFC debut, fighting off to see, hey, who's staying in the UFC. Um, but I agree, man. I think that the headline of the early, early prelims, since by nature most people aren't going to see it, don't need to be really ranked fighters. But I think it should be matchups that are theorized to be entertaining because momentum of a card is such an underrated and undiscussed, under-discussed thing, in my opinion. There's a real momentum as a viewing experience uh of watching fights that are a good fight, good fight, good fight, and then if you get a bad fight, it can really kind of damper the atmosphere. And so that's what you were talking about earlier with fighter placement and fight placements on the cards. It, in my opinion, it's so important to try to just keep the ball rolling. Um, and again, you, at the end of the day, a fight's a fight. It could be a good fight or a bad fight. It doesn't matter who was scheduled to fight. But realistically you can try to put up matchups that are you know are probably going to be fireworks yeah as a fan like you kind of want to from the first fight of the night basically get on this wave and you want that wave to pretty much just take you through to the main event and by uh 
you know, carefully planning out and seeding out your talent throughout the card um, and not just bunching them up in certain places, I feel like, yeah, it's going to add so much to that atmosphere and just the experience of what you were talking about. So now we got fights this Saturday, <laughs> and yes. it's a fight night card. Fight night card this Saturday, yeah. How does it stack up? <laughs> All right, so now that we kind of talked about what our ideal fight card is, let's take a look at this card and basically determine if this is a like a solid card um so starting with the early early prelims you know we'd mentioned headline it with a fun fight and then you know play some some newbies on it um give people a a chance uh new fighters and um so what do you think of it i mean the early prelims for this saturday i mean i think it's pretty much fine like you got people that 90 percent of people who look at this fight card probably aren't going to know any of these guys but you you have the chance for entertaining fights and like i said earlier it's just kind of i view the early early prelims as an outlet of really someone kind of proving they deserve to be there so yeah no i i agree um i mean it's hard to really complain too much about the early prelims i mean the ones this Saturday are pretty much what we had already discussed, you know, lesser known guys kind of getting that platform to to shine, you know, and perform well. I don't know. I I like it. It's okay. It's not bad. <laughs> it's not it's not the worst. It could be worse. It's okay. But it's all okay. going going with the undercard, the the prelims, um now this is where it kind of gets interesting, right? Cuz they got a couple fights on here that are really solid fights. Um you have Eric Silva fighting, who is, he at one point was a prospect in the welterweight division, and he just, he's got a couple losses, and he's kind of lost steam, but nonetheless, he's an exciting fighter. Yeah, I mean, his first couple fights in the UFC, the reason he was considered a prospect is they were all, like, one-minute finishes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he's a finisher, and, and see, in my opinion, if, you, when you talk about, you know, fight placement on a card, that fight eric silva versus luan chagas at 170 pounds would be a great headline for the early prelims because that is going to be a fun fight yeah i mean there, there's just a chance there's a high chance that that fight is gonna at least deliver entertaining aspects eric silva is always usually in I more mean, exciting fights yeah because so. i mean eric silva is either explodes and gets the knockout or kind of gases out and gets finished sometimes so. yeah exactly um you also have juicy formiga versus dustin ortiz and buried in the prelims and this this one just blows my mind travesty <laughs> like i just i can't i mean i do from the ufc's perspective know why maybe but i just cannot agree with that whatsoever <laughs> yeah it really is a shame you have so for people that don't know, Juicy A Formiga versus Dustin Ortiz is a fight in the flyweight division that is 125 pounds, and these are two legitimate top 10 fighters, and they are buried in the early prelims. Yeah, I mean, it's just like, or in people... The, the prelims, rather. We, we got the flyweight champ, Demetrius Johnson, is on the longest active streak of defending his belt uh he's two fights away from breaking the longest streak ever of title defenses and nobody really cares about that division and which is in my opinion a travesty and people wonder why nobody cares about that division and i mean you go online and you see people are like oh it's because they're tiny guys and like unfortunately yes like i've run into a lot of people that have been like I don't want to watch this because I could beat one of them, which is like newsflash. You probably can't. No, uh, they, but I can tell you right now. That you can't. <laughs> not even probably. There's like a ninety nine point nine percent chance you can't, and that point oh one is maybe, maybe if you have a gun or something. I would like, say 100%. but they have literally two top ten guys from this division, and they're not even on the main card. And this division, you know, even though it's the newest division that the UFC has for the men's, is. It's actually more exciting than people think. It's just because Demetrius Johnson is so dominant that it makes it look like that division is shallow, but they have really talented guys there. 
and these two fighters are really talented and you know people wonder like you said why flyweight is may seem boring and it's because the ufc is not pushing these guys they're not trusting uh these fighters to perform and um you know it's a shame because these guys deserve to be way way higher in the card i mean i think these are probably the highest ranked guys on uh, fighting yeah like you could easily make an argument for that (laughs) and then to you know to kind of fill out the undercard the you know the prelims is Hani Yaha versus Michinori Tanaka and Gilbert Burns versus Michael Prezeris is headlining it. Um, just the fact that, you know, if you're putting Juicy Formiga and Dust- Dustin Ortiz on the undercard, I mean, make them headline yeah, it. Yeah, like... There is a difference between being the second one on the undercard and being and headlining the undercard. Like, the UFC themselves have been pushing this. Like, they will... Uh, promote it with oh yeah he- these are the uh, this is the undercard headline by blah 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 you know yeah it, it's just like it would it gives these guys who are solid fighters but nobody really knows who they are an outlet to have a chance for people to watch them because this fight is going to be exciting and it's important fight like this fight is going to determine a change in the top 10 and the just there's a chance that 90% of people who are going to watch any fight this night is not going to watch that fight. Exactly. And, you know, it's, 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 it's an odd, it's an odd undercard because they have really potential between the early prelims and the prelims to, um, you know, spice it up a little bit, make Formiga or Tease like the, the main event of the prelims and then maybe move eric silva to headline the early prelims you know give give people a reason to want to watch the early prelims because i can tell you right now with the early prelims with how they are like if i oversleep or i i'm busy with something and i miss the early prelims this saturday hey man I, i'm okay like yeah i'm gonna be all right i'm not, I'm not gonna lose too much sleep no i'm not mad at all so you know, it's just it. It I I seriously think the next big thing the UFC should consider is fight placement in cards. Yeah. It is. It is a wave, man. It's an experience. You know, going through the whole thing. And, uh, but moving on to the main card now. Any notable? You know, this card is in Brazil, so UFC usually stacks the cards with or at least one Brazilian fighter. Like. Yeah, or wherever country they're fighting, they'll stack the card with that country's fighters. Um, so there are a lot of Brazilian fighters here, um, which is great, but are there any notable ones? This is the main card we're talking about. We're talking about a main card to a UFC fight night. We said earlier what we wish it and think that it should be. Does this main card match up to that? Now, as a fight night card, because as we discussed earlier, yeah, fight night cards by nature are going to be a little less important than pay-per-views. So, by nature, the the main card is going to be a little less important than the main card pay-per-views. Because, I mean, that's a whole other discussion, but the main card and pay-per-views generally be all lead of the league. Um, Generally, main card of the fight night cards... Uh, should have high level guys with guys starting to come up through the ranks and give them the outlet to shine. When I look at this card, I see a couple good fights and I see no reason to watch this card as a casual viewer. (laughs) There's just kind of not much going for it in the important side of it. Now, sitting back and as a hardcore fight fan there are some fights that I'm intrigued in (laughs) like we got Francisco Trinaldo versus Paul Felder which is going to be a great fight to watch Paul Felder is a serious prospect and this is where my complaint comes in is because that in my opinion is a perfect fight on the main card of a fight night but because there's no sort of support of a higher-ranked fighter, the, the fight's going to get overlooked by, like, a lot of people that just choose to skip this card. Uh, 
So, I mean, what do you think of the main card? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I I like certain fights on it. Um, Paul Felder is always fun. He's, again, another guy that he has in the past headline early prelims, and he could have done it again here. Um, because this fight in the long term probably isn't there there aren't high stakes for it but paul felder is certainly a guy on the rise man he trains with donald cowboy cerrone he's probably the biggest lightweight i've ever seen in the ufc and um and yeah so that's a fun fight um and then you have heavyweight roy nelson big country (laughs) big belly fighting antonio bigfoot silva um, slash big head big head easter island head and you know this is a fight that again it's a i guess it's a fun fight i don't know how many more times i can see bigfoot knocked out before i just yeah. i'm too i'll get too bummed to watch see i the nature of this fight i like being on there because it's named guys that will bring some viewers to come watch the card while i agree it is a fight night so they're named guys that aren't ranked the highest so it's like okay they're pretty high enough ranked in their division to be on the main card their names but it's definitely a fight that i would be pissed if that was on the pay-per-view so that's why i can kind of see okay throw it on the main card let people come watch for them and then see the other fights that in my opinion are much more important because i don't know about you but a i do not really care who wins this fight no. Both of these fighters have shown that they don't really have too much left in terms of longevity. I agree. None, none of them have too much to offer, like heavyweights right now. I mean, it's heavyweight, anything can happen, but Roy Nelson has been fringe top 10 for years, and I don't think he's beaten a single top 10 guy in the UFC uh, Bigfoot Silva just hasn't been the same since, um, you know, he got st- off the TRT. Yeah, stopped using TRT, and you know he's he gets knocked out. It seems like every other fight, and yeah. <laughs> it's getting like a bummer to watch. But there's no st- there's no stakes for the sport, you know what I mean? As far as like and in their divisions, there's not high stakes for it. But it's a fun fight, so I it's good to be. Uh, it's a good fight to have on the main card of a fight night, though. I mean, it's it's a fun fight. It's two names. Like you said, it's going to draw eyes to the card. People are going to tune in because they see Big Country up there. Even though Newsflash, if he's your favorite fighter, he is not top ten. Neither is Bigfoot. And there's a very high chance that this fight lasts maybe a minute. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah, well, that's a huge thing. And there's a very high chance that this fight ends in a finish. Yes, so... I am predicting there will be a knockout. I'm going to go out on a limb. Um, crazy, I know, but I think a knockout is uh, coming in this fight. The co-main event. Now, we talked about, ideally, a fight between two top 15 guys in any division. You have the former... Bantamweight champion Henan Barrow, who moved up in weight, he is a featherweight now, fighting at 145 pounds. He made his debut uh, a little bit ago against Jeremy Stevens and lost. And this is his first fight back coming off that loss against Philippe Nover. Um, so what do you think? It's a former champ, but he's not he's not ranked yet in this division, and Philippe Nover certainly isn't ranked in this division see to me this is a very questionable matchup anyways and i don't think it should be coming i think that this should have been maybe fight number three on the card um uh from the top <laughs> so like the third to last fight on the card because him bro you gotta ex- respect what he's done he's not ranked in his division yet but i mean until Dillashaw, TJ Dillashaw completely mauled him. I mean, there were people saying he was pound for pound number one, could go down as one of the greats. Okay, and let's not talk about that. <laughs> now, whether you agree with that or not, entirely different topic. But he is at least a formidable fighter. And so it's just, in my opinion, this is a questionable matchup anyway. Because 
It, it to me it almost looks like it's a Brazilian fighter in Brazil. He's coming off a loss, and they give him Felipe Nover, or Felipe Nover, who, yeah, he could go in there and shock people and win, but I just I kind of see this as a gimme fight for Barral, and so I agree. I don't think that gimme fights should ever be main or co-main event. Yeah, like it just kind of disrespects the spot. <laughs> It, it kind of does, yeah. And Hen and Barrow, see, what I would rather have is have that flyweight fight that I discussed from earlier, Juicy Formiga versus Dustin Ortiz. That could have been a co-main event. But the problem is is that, you know, there's the whole thing with, well, those guys aren't a name. Hen and Barrow's a name. They can advertise them as former champion. But you're not going to build your future champions unless you give them a shot. And, like, guys like Juicy Formiga... Dustin Ortiz, whether or not you think they're ever going to be champion, these guys are at least ranked in their division. Um, so, so yeah, you know, it's kind of a... I don't know how I feel about that as a coming event, even though I am, as a fan, like, I'm excited to see Hennon Burrell back. Um, yeah. He's definitely kind of lost steam after his last fight, you know, losing against Stevens, and he was, you know, top 10 guy at featherweight, so it's no shame in that, but you know, it's still, he's got an uphill, uh... He's kind of got an uphill battle right now. He does. And, and he, this is a must-win for him, too. Yeah. Like, if he loses this fight, I don't even know what to do with him anymore. Because yeah. he can't really drop back down. I don't see him really ever beating Cruz. And we've seen how he fares against CJ Dillashaw. So, he's kind of stuck at 145, unless he's okay with hanging around and not ever reaching a title again and it's just yeah this is there's a lot of pressure on Barrow to perform and so as a fan I'm kind of excited to see how he does but I just don't think that this is the right spot for it yeah it's probably not the best co-main event but you do have that story you have the story of a former champion and and this is, his back is against the wall here. He really needs to win this fight if he wants to get back on track. This will be a huge setback, and without a doubt, the largest setback that he has ever. He's lost before, only a couple times. He at one point had the longest active win streak in MMA while he was a champion. You know he's lost twice to TJ Dillashaw. Um, he's lost once to Jeremy Stevens, and that was his last fight. Uh, but nothing will set him back if he loses this fight. So if you're, you know, you tune in, you watch this fight, there is that backstory that this is kind of a. I don't know if I would say do or die for Brow, but I kind of want to say do or die. It's it's not do or die in the sense of I'm gonna get cut from the UFC if I lose this, but it's do or die in the sense of do I want to have a future in this sport still? Yeah. Exactly, and you you know he was he was a good champion. Like he was a good champion while he while he kind of reigned over one thirty five. Um, but yeah, this is this fight is really going to show us, uh, you know, if Barrow still has it in him. Yeah, and and again, I mean, this is for Felipe Nova a chance to shoot up in the rankings relatively. But I just again. It's. I don't think that these chances, like this is Felipe Nover's kind of first test, and I don't really think these first tests should be this high up on a card. It, it kind of should be reserved for, let's give this guy, hey, a chance, and not really... Yeah, no, I agree. Um, but let's move on to the main event. Um, what we talked about earlier, this is the most important fight on the card. It should be, ideally should be a fight between two top 10 fighters of any weight class um but we have something else and it's interesting for one reason in particular it doesn't exist inside a division <laughs> yes that is the biggest thing this fight is not being held in any division in women's mma it is I, we are of course talking about the main event is headlined by Chris Cyborg uh, taking on, who typically fights at 145 pounds as a featherweight, 
Um, and she's fighting a UFC newcomer, Lena Landsberg, who's still pretty green in her career. Very, very green. Yeah. I mean, again, like, this is her UFC debut. Exactly. And, and she's typically a 135-er, I believe. Yeah. And they're meeting at a catch weight of 140 pounds. Cyborg is so big, she cannot get down to that 135-pound weight limit, which is pretty much the hottest division as far as, like, mainstream is concerned. That's Ronda's division, um, Holly Holmes in that division. Um, but Cyborg can't cut down to make that weight. I mean, she's a big girl. Can't was maybe air quotes around it. Yeah, it could be. I mean, if you look at her, there's a picture online of her standing next to the former lightweight men's champion, Frankie Edgar, and she dwarfs him. That's true. <laughs> like, it is insane how big this girl is. Um, but she's so close. It's like five yeah. pounds away from 135. And you gotta think, like, she carries so much muscle that if she maybe stopped that's, weightlifting... That's, like, my only reason for why I add the air quotes is, like, yes, I understand you can't cut any more water out of your body, but that's not the only way to drop weight. <laughs> it's not, no. You can burn muscle. You know, she, like, like we just said, you know, she's she carries a lot of muscle with her. There are ways to do that. Um, but, of course, it's an extremely difficult thing to do. But nonetheless, she's fighting at a catch rate of 140, uh, 140 pounds against Lena Landsberg. Um, I'm going to start by asking you why they made this fight. Um, why on earth did they make this fight? I don't know. <laughs> I well, genuinely... Well, I know, but no one from a fighting fight perspe Cyborg, right? perspective... Yeah, no one wants to fight Cyborg. In case you don't know, Cyborg is widely considered probably the best female MMA fighter today. She, um, I will say here, I will sit here with certainty, certainty and say that Chris Cyborg is the baddest woman on the planet. Yeah, and there's a lot of reasons behind that. Technique, strength, her freaking size. Um, and no one wants to fight her. <laughs> and that also is because there's a lot of 135 pound women who don't want to go up to 145 pounds. So then we have end up with situations like this, where it's like, okay, we'll do 140 pounds, but still, like, it's kind of unfair for to take a natural 135 pounder and be like, why aren't you coming up and fighting me? So it's like, the only women that end up fighting her, and the reason why I think this girl is in this fight, is there's probably some clause that's like, hey, come in, fight Cyborg, you get a UFC deal. So she's probably just using this as an entry into the UFC's 135-pound division. And, yeah, if she beats Cyborg, that's massive. But this is a prospect that would probably have gotten signed in a little bit anyways. But this is just kind of giving her a quicker track to the UFC. Uh, so that's just my thoughts on why she took the fight. But from like a perspective of the sport it's like what <laughs> yeah it's it's uh it's always tough to kind of jump on board with some of these fights sometimes i mean i think almost everyone can agree that cyborg is probably going to win in spectacular fashion in this fight in very, I, I just very quick fashion yeah. maybe I, I mean, mean I, don't, I think one of her fights in the past six years has gone past the first round. I mean, Cyborg is just knocking these girls out. And, you know, they, like you said, you know, no one wants to fight this girl. So, Lena Landsberg, huge props to her for stepping up, taking this fight, saying, you know, I'll fight anyone. Um, you know, Chris Cyborg, she said she took the fight immediately. Um, she didn't hesitate at all. And yeah, I mean, no disrespect to Lena, because I've watched a couple of her fights, and she legitimately looks like, if she grows, she has the potential to do really well. And props to her for taking this fight, when not a lot of other people would. She's it's... just, yeah, like, we were, you know, we're kind of like looking over some of her fights, and she is, she has a lot of potential to, uh... To do some work in the UFC, but again, you know, they're throwing her to the wolves. You know, Chris Cyborg, who, you know, is probably going to... I mean, Chris Cyborg is crazy. She is so 
good. Like, her striking has just jumped leaps and bounds over the last, like, two, three years. Um, she started working with a famous MMA coach, I believe, Jason Perillo. Uh, yeah, I think so. And um, her boxing just looks so sharp. Her last fight, she was level changing, sh- uh, mixing it up to the body, um, and ended up knocking the girl she fought out in like 30 seconds, a minute, something like that. So Cyborg is definitely, and this is why I find it hard, because I would like two fights between, or a single fight as a main event between two top 10 fighters. Instead, we don't get that, but what we do get is a chance to watch the baddest woman on the planet fight. So it is kind of this odd thing where you're like, well... And there, you, you can't try to build Cyborg as a star. Like, I'm sorry, but you're not going to. Yeah. She's not going to be a star um, on the course that she's on now. She's The only way Chris Cyborg will be a star is if she can make that 135-pound weight and fight some of these girls that are mainstream. Yeah, I mean, as long as you keep, div- like, fighting in a catchweight division that doesn't exist, it, it, she doesn't have the potential to really go anywhere. Yeah, she's kind of running and in circles at this to point. to hardcore fans, yes, you recognize she's probably the best. But to a lot of more casual watchers, you can. You, it's impossible to create a storyline for her to go get the belt because there's no belt. It doesn't exist. Yeah, and she like, keeps calling out Ronda, but the only way she's going to be a star is if she does drop to that weight. She can fight girls like Ronda and Holly Holm and Misha Tate, Amanda Nunes, who's the current champ, just these super high-level women bantamweight fighters, um, you know, and and make a name for herself. But I think, yeah, keep... keep uh, you know, placing her in these odd positions where she's fighting people at catch weights, and you got to sit here and think, you know, what are they really trying to promote with this? Yeah, and it's just she's in the main event. Obviously, they're trying to push her, but it, like you said, it's like, hey, you're pushing her into an abyss. It's like, where's she gonna go? There's like, there's nowhere to go. There's nowhere to go. It's just like a black hole. It's like she's gonna get sucked in this black hole, and okay cool it's like yeah it's like wow she beat another girl that she was supposed to beat and you know there's there's no stakes here but there's something special in the sense that you are going to get to see the baddest woman on the planet earth fight and there's something to that that is like a slight redeeming quality again is this main event worthy absolutely not (laughs) i agree that that little bit of redeeming quality about getting to see her fight yeah, put her maybe early main card of the fight night. Do not give her the main event when it doesn't mean anything. See, even her as a co-main, I could get down for that. I wouldn't mind that. But a main event too, yeah. Again, there's that business side balancing with the sports side. If you really want to keep this a sport, um, you got to put the high-ranked guys, the elites in the division, give them a platform to to sell themselves. And, you know, Chris Cyborg, again, what are you trying to sell with this? You know? There's just... There's too many... There's too many things that don't matter with that matchup. And it's a shame. Because I'm interested to see Cyborg fight. I'm interested to see Lena fight. Because she does look like she has the chance to grow. Um, like in a lot of her earlier fights, she had a very good clinch game, uh, and she had a pretty good striking. Uh, you can kind of tell that she's still green though, because as soon as she starts doing combinations, she gets what I call the Betch Carrera effect, where she stands straight up with her chin up, which isn't going to bode too well against Cyborg. No, because Cyborg is the master at doing that. Cyborg is so technically sound. And she, you know, ever since she started working with Jason Perillo, she's really tightened up her boxing. But Cyborg still has that in her where, you know, if she senses blood in the water or the other person starts firing back, Cyborg has no issue biting down on her mouthpiece, swinging back, you know, winging winging shots. And uh, Cyborg's usually hit first and harder. So that's definitely not the game Lena Landsberg is going to want to play here. Yeah, so, like, as a main event, interesting fight, 
does not deserve to be main event. <laughs> I agree. So, overall, looking at the card, um, should you watch this? <laughs> should you watch this card? Is this worth watching? Uh, in my opinion, there's enough fights that are going to be entertaining enough that, well, as much as we talked bad about this card, I think it's worth it to tune in because. You got guys like Paul Felder versus Francisco Trinaldo, which they're both looking very good currently, and it's going to be an entertaining fight. You got a fight like Jusier Formiga versus Dustin Ortiz that is a high-profile fight and deserves to be much higher. And it's buried in the prison. And it's just buried, but you should watch that fight. Um, and you got Hembarau. It's going to be interesting to see him <laughs> and see where he goes. And, like you said, you got the chance to see the baddest woman probably make some quick work, but who knows? Like, it, it's watchable, but I'm also going to put the disclaimer that if you sleep through it, if you're a casual watcher, probably not the worst. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Um, I think there are levels, depending on how uh, into the sport you are at this point. Um, if you're a hard, hardcore MMA fan, you know, you will you could find yourself probably watching every single fight. Um, but, you know, it, if you're a casual and you miss uh, th these, some of these fights, uh, you're not missing much because there's not a lot of stakes. And because these f the only fights that are kind of notable on this card are placed... Uh, in such strange positions that it would almost be okay to miss chunks of this card um but in turn you're gonna probably end up missing like one of those notable fights just because of where it is in the card um which is unfortunate so as a casual you know get in the time machine and go watch last saturday's event <laughs> yeah last saturday was the the main event that's that's what you want out of a main event you want two top 10 guys and their stakes. Um, you know, the only storylines you have here is, you know, Henan Barrow, does he still have it in him? And Chris Cyborg, just let's see, you know, how well is the baddest woman on the planet going to perform in this fight, you know? And overall, you know, if you're a casual and you miss this, this fight card, I wouldn't lose sleep over it. Um, I'm going to watch it personally. I am a hardcore fan. Uh, I'm going to support it, but gosh, like, if you can only. To, and I, if we had an ideal fight card, this would not be a good card. Yeah. Like, if you're only willing to put away one Saturday this month, don't spend this Saturday to watch fights. <laughs> there are the rest of the cards this month that are much more worth it to check those out than this one. Yeah, and uh, so really quickly, um, who do you have in the co-main event? Um, I mean, I, I just got to go with Hanbrough. I mean, anything can happen in a fight, but I'm, I'm going to have to pick Hanbrough on this one. Yeah, I agree. I think Hennen, um, you know, like we said, the storyline, does he have it in him? I think he does. I think he has... A little bit in him, even though he lost his last fight. Um, you know, I rewatched that today, and I actually think that there was slight um, adjustments that Barrow made that made me kind of optimistic because Barrow has been someone who hasn't really changed his game up. He stagnated for the longest time, but now we're seeing him doing a few things different. So he could be on the right track. You know, who knows how far that'll take him, but I think it'll take him far enough to be. Philippe Nover on Saturday. Uh, the main event, Chris Cyborg versus Lena Landsberg uh, in the women's, at a women's catchweight bout of 140 pounds. Who do you think wins it? I think we're going to have to go with Lena. You're going Lena? No, wow. okay. no way. There's no way. <laughs> Cyborg is going to win this Wait fight. A and that's just. If these, Lena these wins this. These are facts. Let's just say that. I will probably react almost as bad as I did to Bisbing, <laughs> oh. beating Rockle. <laughs> wow, that level. Yeah, I could see it. I mean, I don't know the odds. I know Lena's got to be a massive underdog. Uh, I don't know anyone 
honestly, who is picking Lena? Props to her for taking this fight. She has potentially a future in her division. Um, I don't think it's going to start Saturday night. I think Cyborg is going to starch her. I think she's going to finish her in the first round. Um, so, yeah. Uh, so, it's up to you guys if you want to go watch this fight card. So but. Should, should you watch it as a casual? If you got things to do, you got things to do. No big deal. You miss it. But if you're a fan, there are some fights on there that are kind of redeemable. Uh, overall, as a fight night card, for me, I would not... I, I couldn't find it in me to say, oh yeah, this is a good card. Yeah, I, I would not say it's a good card, but because of how much a fan of MMA I am, I can't look away. <laughs> like, I'm going to be watching it, so... Like, I might even just tune into some of the notable fights that we discussed. Uh, yeah, who knows? Um, yeah, it's really going to depend how the day goes. <laughs> exactly. Um, alright, well, I think that's probably going to be it um, for yeah, the first that was episode. Wraps up first attempt, went way longer than we hoped. But... Uh, that went way longer. <laughs> uh, we were going to try to keep this to about 20 to 25 minutes, and we're pushing an hour here, so we're just going to wrap it up. Um, I don't know, if you sat there and listened to any part of this, that's amazing. And uh, I know, we're just giving this thing a shot, so. Can try something new. Hey. Let me bang again, man. Let you bang.